Um, so good evening and welcome to our 14th uh, Imagine event. I'm Alastair Bruard. I'm with uh, this group here, the Cambridge Commons, uh, which is a local group uh, and we uh, inequality uh, in this area and we're bringing these talks to you in collaboration with Anglo Ruskin's Labour History Group. So uh, thanks to them and all our wonderful volunteers and some. We've got another great speaker for you tonight, Thomas in Cave, uh, and another vital topic within the knotted ball of issues uh, which have driven inequality to unacceptable levels. Uh, we usually start by explaining how we imagine 2027 works. Uh, each talk is themed. Uh, we've covered uh, education, uh, racism, tax, sustainability, and lots of other uh, things, and you can catch the recordings on our website. Um, tonight it's about uh, reining in corporate malfeasance and the slightly abusive uh, relationship between the public and private sectors, uh, leading to work out who's abusing who. Uh, but the series about, is about seeing how pervasive uh, inequality is. It's a kind of Medusa's head of uh, uh, serpents. And uh, you tackle one, you get bitten by others. Um, so we need holistic solutions to tackle inequality everywhere, all at once, uh, in housing, health, tax, you name it. Uh, we need to give them the Jews a makeover. So after tonight, we've got uh, one more event, a speaking event on media, and then we're going to move to uh, action uh, with our first forum, uh, where specific initiatives that you can get involved with will be uh, discussed and presented. Uh, so that's all on our website, um, and we'll mention it at the end. Uh, we're now also holding monthly meet-up events, which are informal opportunities to go and have a, a drink with people who are also working on things that are relevant to inequality locally. So uh, please feel free to get involved. Cambridge uh, is a very unequal city, but there's a massive amount of, uh, you know, money here, uh, time, enthusiasm, loads of ideas, and we really ought to be a bit of a beacon uh, for uh, solving this terrible problem that's led us down the road to Brexit and Trump and rotten society and everything else. Um, so, some quick admin before I hand over. Uh, the, if you want Wi-Fi, you need that pin and it will disappear shortly, so take it now. Uh, any fire alarm is real and there's a, an exit there as well as there we send along on the road. And uh, a reminder that we are recording events, so if that's a problem, let us know. And use the mics in the Q&A afterwards, please. So finally, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to our chair, David Howarth, who you probably know well. He's 20 years in government, local and uh, Westminster, and he's now Professor of Law and Public Policy at uh, Cambridge University, and he will introduce Thomas in the chair the discussion afterwards. So thank you, David. Thank you, Alistair. Um, so tonight's speaker is Thomas in who is a writer, Commentator, but I think the whole campaign. Uh, she's the director of Spinwatch, uh, which has been investigating corporate PR and lobbying, uh, spin by government, uh, for quite a while. I think so that Spinwatch itself was set in, in about 1996. Um, in around 2007, it established something called the Alliance for Lobbying Transparency, which is a coalition of NGOs and unions. Um, many of whom, you might think slightly ironically, are lobbyists themselves. Um, but, but they were concerned about the growing influence of lobbying on policymaking in the UK, um, as was I at the time, and I'll explain this a bit later on. Um, but um, unlike um, those other organisations, um, the Alliance for Lobbying Transparency is funded by uh, Roundtree. And so Townsend has been uh, involved in Spinwatch and, 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 and through Spinwatch uh, with the ALT for all, that, all the time that ALT has been going, I think. Um, 
and has been uh, a leading campaigner for transparent, transparency in the lobbying industry. Um, interestingly, Townsend did some lobbying herself. He did. Um, for example, on behalf of, of small producers of milk. Because it came back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very fun with. And then before that, she edited a magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a magazine cattle through Shelfsbury Avenue. Yeah, Mark. Oh, yeah, that. That's fantastic. Um, but uh, uh, the main topic that we're going to talk about tonight is, is um, not milk, um, but uh, lobbying, corporate lobbying, and government spin as it exists now. Her book, uh, called Quiet Word, Lobbying, Crony Capitalism and Broken Politics, is full of insights uh, into the nefarious world of lobbying. Um, it came out uh, four years ago in 2014, and I'm guessing that things haven't gotten better since. <coughs> Um, hello, thank you very much for coming um, and for having me. Um, I am going to talk about lobbying, and I've done this so many times. I, and I, I'm often in front of a room full of corporate lobbyists, and I stand there, and the first thing I say is, I am a lobbyist, it's like AA, you understand? Okay? I am a lobbyist, otherwise get accused of hypocrisy, but I am. I'm a lobbyist for transparency regulation for lobbyists, but I am um, also, as David said, I campaign against the industry. So I'm going to talk tonight about <coughs> lobbying which, if you're not familiar with it, is we define it as it's any attempt to influence the decisions of government. So when you write to your MP or uh, I sign a petition, we are trying to sway government decisions. Um, and it is an essential part of any healthy democracy. Um, so what is the problem? Um, and specifically, why do I describe it as a gateway um, problem? And I'm going to try and explain in the context of this series, actually, in looking forward and 10 years and how we can get progressive change to some of these policies in place in the next decade. And in preparation for this talk, I actually watched um, some of the videos of previous talks, and I'm going to encourage you to do it because they are amazing. Um, there are people there with fantastic ideas around affordable housing, how to solve kind of land reform, economics, what we mentioned tax, public health. I mean, a whole range of ideas, and they have got practical, thought-through policy ideas that we could implement tomorrow. But, as fantastic as they are, I watched it, and I, because of what I do, I thought, what are the odds of any of these ideas ever seeing the light of day? What are the chances of any of these things actually happening in the next decade? Because I'm sitting there from the perspective, and for every person who puts forward an environmental policy idea, I can see in the back of my head, I can see the fracking lobby, which is huge in this country, the oil lobby. Then you've got the, ta I mean, there's a tax haven lobby in this country. You are not going to get tax reform unless you get rid of that lobby. And so whilst lobbying is not the most significant challenge that faces this country, it is, as I describe it, a gateway problem. Unless you tackle lobbying and the might of the corporate lobbyists, the chances of you getting anything else done is quite slim. Because standing in your way is... The thing I'm going to describe, which is everybody familiar with the fatberg? Yeah. No, okay. it's a sort of, it's a fatberg, it's underground and it is blocking our democracy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we have another way of putting it. So, yeah, it's fat. think of the fatberg. Um, so, um, I'm going to describe this fatberg, and normally that's what my talks consist of. It's like 40 minutes of describing this industry and how they corrupt our politics and it's really depressing <laughs> and the book is nine chapters of really depressing and then you have to have the obligatory chapter at the end which has the solutions and yes you talk about transparency transparency is one of the solutions if you open up lobbying for public scrutiny if you open the curtains of government and you can see into the room of who is talking to whom about what then the public has an opportunity to challenge their claims and counter what the corporate lobbies are saying. For the moment, the curtains are closed, so we can't see. Um, so transparency is one solution, but it's... I have been depressing people for the best part of 10 years, practically, going around giving these talks, but I was urged to be positive, but despite what I, I am positive at the moment, 
Completely, coincidentally, I am. I think something is happening in this country which is very exciting and very interesting. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe the depressing fact book. And then I'm going to go on and I'm going to talk about why I think there are some changes happening, some cracks appearing, and hopefully some of the fat folk is dissolving. Okay, there you go. Enough of the fat folk, let's not do Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about what this influence industry looks like. This is a cartoon map because there is no map of the lobbying industry. We don't know what it looks like. This is a key feature of it. It is entirely secret. So, um, I'm going, to, I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to give you a little virtual cartoon <laughs> tour of what it looks like um, using this map. It's quite handy actually because it, what it does is it, it, it takes us from Parliament here and it takes us to, you can just see Canary Wharf and the city in the background. And what the lobbying industry does, quite so slightly geographically but also uh, metaphorically, it's the bridge between money and politics. They, they connect the two. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to talk you so, just quickly through some of the kind of what this industry looks like so you're familiar with it. So, a little tourist guide, I'm going to take you on a tour. Because they, they come in different guises, always. Um, so, what I'm going to start, here we have Parliament and the streets, it's not a totally good map, but the streets of Whitehall and Westminster. So, you've got, you've got this is the centre of town, this is where the decision makers are. So, just in the shadow, our first lot of lobbyists are just in the shadow of Parliament and very nice, I think they're Georgian terraces in St James's. And this is where the, the oldest, this is, this is where the sort of lobbying industry in this country actually started. Um, and these are with, the, they call themselves think tanks now, um, as well what they are, which is business lobby groups, the majority of them are business lobby groups. Um, and the first one that arrived in this country, the best part of 100 years ago, was called National Propaganda. They call it what it is. <laughs> um, uh, it then changed its name to the Economic League, League. but it's, this is where they started, and this is where the think tanks clustered now. So this is where the Institute of Economic Affairs is, and the Centre for Policy Studies, and all the Thatcher, like Free Market, Neoliberal think tanks are all clustered around here, very, very close to Parliament, and that's you know, another mistake. So, um, I should say, actually, the reason why they started a hundred years ago um, is, and it's, you know, it's quite pertinent now, a um, hundred years ago was when the electorate suddenly tripled um, and uh, we suddenly had uh, the rise of a, of, a, of a Labour Party that actually could challenge business interests and the, the industrialists at the time got together and they realised they needed to defend their, their personal, private, financial interests against democracy. So lobbyists will talk about how you know lobbying is as old as ancient Rome and Greece and the forums and you know whatever and the Magna Carta and petitioning the barons and that's politics. It is actually it's, it's the rise of democracy as well as the proper getting people getting the vote and threatening their business interests. So that's that's a big case, and I'll come back to national propaganda at the end. Um, if we come up here, I'm going to talk you through the next lot. There's a sort of I don't, I don't really. The ropey end of Oxford Street, as it was, it's there probably because the crossroad is quite nice, but if you go to the ropey end of, of Oxford Street, it's sort of Covent Garden area, and then head east, there's a strip there, which is where you will find the lobbyists that are aligned with the public relations industry. Now, they are a big part of the public relations industry, because so much of this is to do with space and PR and media kind of massaging. Um, so you get the big agencies. The best, the most well known is, is Bell Pottinger, sadly no more. Um, for that business, but this is where the big global firms are. As you head out east, you will come across some of the big law firms. They are lobbyists as well. And um, since Brexit, we have seen the U.S. law firms who do a lot more lobbying. They've come over um, and they've installed themselves here. So there's the law firms. You've also got, as you head over towards the city, the big management consultancies and the and the big four accountancy firms. They also lobby. Um, and then you've got the city itself and the city of London Corporation, one of the most powerful lobbyists in the country. Um, and then interspersed in all of this, you've got all the trade bodies for every industry, you all have a trade body, and then you've got the corporations themselves. So you've got along the river here is BAT, the tobacco company, you've got BP's offices around Pall Mall, 
Um, so for every corporation, they will have an in-house team of lobbyists. And so this gives you kind of an idea of the scale. And it's permanently camped here. These people are permanently camped here. And it is, this, is the, this is the commercial lobbying industry. These are the people who are paid to influence the decisions of government. And it is so heavily weighted towards the corporate industry and sector. It's so, it, it, the money comes from corporations and from the financial sector for one reason, is that lobbying has become a way of making money. Lobbying is seen as a strategic investment by corporations in that you get a return. For every pound spent, you get a return back. Because government represents one or two things, either an opportunity to profit or a threat to your profits. So an opportunity might be government might decide, or you might want government to decide to open up the NHS to more private sector involvement. That's a £120 billion pound budget. That's a nice opportunity, it's a nice juicy opportunity, and we want to petition government to do that. A risk might be, the tobacco industry has had risks regulation for years, and then the alcohol industry, uh, because of public health issues, um, they're, they have, they're facing the risk of, of serious regulation, um, and so that will damage your profit. So this is why they, they lobby, is, is because of money not for any other reason. And that's why it's corporately dominated. There are NGOs, obviously, and there are trade unions and others who uh, lobby, and they're in the fields. They're in the cheap seats over there. They're not in this field, by and large. Okay. Um, uh, and yeah, as I said, so this lot is, is permanently camped here. That's kind of what it looks like. Um, I'm going to now talk about quickly about how they operate. So you're familiar with the kind of the ways that they, they build influence, because it doesn't happen magically. There are kind of th things that you need. You need the right people, you need the right skills, you need the right processes, and you need money to do it. So I'm going to talk about three ways that they, they secure um, this influence. The first being, uh, this is my little Rhodes Gallery, um, is uh, um, they need access. They need to be in a room with politicians. This is the first and foremost, this is the thing they need. Um, and they've worked out the easy way of doing it is to hire somebody who's just come out of the room. Basically, so hire somebody who's just come out of government, or who knows government, or who's related to government, or whatever. But they, so this is why you get the revolving door. It's a defining feature of the lobbying industry, is people moving straight from politics straight into the lobbying industry. So I'm going to just quickly go through these people here. The man with the pink tie is um, Roman Rudd. He's one of the most powerful lobbyists in the country. He runs an agency called Finsbury. They have a lot of, kind of 100 clients. Um, he happens to be Amber Rudd's brother, um, and he's, he, that's not where he gets his power from. This man, I mean, the New Labour days, you can see him there with Peter Madison. I mean, he's immensely well connected, um, as is his firm. Uh, the Brexit secretary, the, the no, Brexit minister, Robin Walker, used to work for Finsbury for 10 years and, you know, various things. He's very clever. What he does, I mean, one of the things he does, is he, he has a very nice Kensington townhouse, and he organises dinners. And you will get the minister and their partner along, and then some corporate CEOs of his clients, and they will all sit down to dinner and have a very nice time. The minister might say a few words, and then you get to quiz the minister or whatever. And he has these regularly, Boris Johnson, been to them, various people. Um, and so it's all very social. These bonds are formed over dinner and drinks, and it's all very nice and cosy. Um, well, David Cameron described it as a cosy club at the top making decisions in their own interests. This is basically what he's talking about. So that's where the most. Moving on to another dinner, this looks not quite so fun. Um, <laughs> this, is, um, this, is the, this is a lunch at Davos this year, um, run by a law firm, a US law firm called Cor Corrington and Burling, I think that's what they're called. Um, and while they're here, this is your lobbyist, this is Francis Maud. He's just gone to work from Francis Maud being an ex-Cameron minister, um, a very, still very influential figure. He's actually standing next to David Cameron. But around the table are their unnamed clients and those people. So this is at Davos. Again, so you can see how ex-ministers revolve it, revolve it into the um, industry. And he's advising their clients, which we know nothing about, on how to um, influence Brexit. Um, if we go straight up here, oh, I should say the link between these two is David Cameron. David Cameron's neighbour is a guy called Lord Chatterington, and this is his daughter's wedding. She happens to be a Google lobbyist, right? And she used to work for Jeremy Hunt when he was culture secretary. So she went from the culture secretary straight into, into, into Google, working as their lobbyist, very useful hire for them. Um, and this was their wedding. David Cameron was there, but presumably Google people was there were there, were there too. And I, I always think, you know, in these social worlds, it, it just must be socially awkward to just turn around to Google and say, do you know, could you pay for more tax? 
<laughs> it's just not done, you know, this very social world. And then moving on to this guy here, and this guy Prashanka Singh, and I don't know if you've heard of him, he's a very hard Brexit guy, he has unrivaled access to ministers, he's met everybody multiple times, and he's an official advisor to Lee Fox. He is also working for Lord Chaddington's old firm, it's called Huntsworth, it's a group of lobbying agencies, and he's just taken up a place so he is a commercial lobbyist, who is advising Lee and Fox. He also works for the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is one of the free market think tanks as well. So, dual roles. And, and you see this blurring the line between lobbyist and official and advisor and the like. So these people have un unrivaled access. I could have chosen so many others. This is just to give you an idea. They need access and need job shapes through people like this. And then can talk very quickly, probably, about the other thing they need to do. So they've got the access, but they need to get their message across to um, government, um, and the best way to do that is over a gin and tonic in quiet negotiation, ideally, because then you haven't any public scrutiny and you can do deals. Otherwise, you might want to hire a think tank and get the minister along and do it then quiet from there. But sometimes you need to shout at ministers to get them to do what you want, and, you, and the way to do that is through the press. So, lobbyists are very adept at manipulating our press, and our press is full of I mean, normally they're selling us products and lifestyles and blah, 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 but they sell us ideas as well. And so it's, it's, it's full of campaigns um, and the seeding of ideas by lobbyists. I just pulled out this one, which was from a couple of years ago. This was a campaign that was to scrap the top rate of tax. Um, and uh, it was run by this company here, which is a lobbying company called Westbourne, the Tax <coughs> Designs, which is a kind of a big grassroots secretly funded organisation. And they ran a campaign which included basically getting the commentary out on board. So they sent out these kind of myth-busting things, had favourable editorials in the press. And it actually wasn't about trying to change public opinion, because public opinion was way over in favour of keeping the top rate of tax. But what they needed to do was give George Osborne, who wanted to drop the tax, cover. So they got all the commentary out and everybody to agree. They got economists to write, they got you know, a bunch of bosses, corporate CEOs, to write to the press, calling for it to be scrapped. Still, public opinion wildly in favour of it, but it gave George Osborne cover to actually drop it. So that's, that's a kind of classic thing. Another thing that they do in the press, and this is an important thing, is, is about framing debates. So, um, the best way to talk about this, is corporations don't want to have debates um, uh, that they can't win. So maybe it's a company who's got a bad environmental record, it doesn't want to debate that with the public, it wants to debate something else, so they'll start talking about jobs or something like that. So that's, they want to be on ground that they can win, and it's just a couple of examples. The top one is there because it's an example of how not to do it. This is HS2. HS2, wow, that was badly sold. It was, I mean, it's basically this huge project that was sold on the fact that it was going to reduce the time to Birmingham for a bunch of business people by 20 minutes. Didn't justify the millions spent on it. So they needed to, they needed to reframe the, the debate. And so they made it all about jobs in the North versus these NIMBYs in the South. Entirely fictional. If you've met anybody who's anti HS2, you'll know that they're, they're a very diverse bunch. And so the, the claim that it's going to bring economic job, uh, economic growth in the North is entirely fictitious as well. But they reckoned that this was a, this is a, a ground that they could win on. So, but nobody bought it because it was entirely fictional. But these two were successful. Two referendums. This is the warm-up, and this is the other one. And they were run by the same people. So the first one was, um, the campaign, the referendum, whether we want a, an alternative voting system. So getting rid of the uh, first past the post system and replacing it with a slightly better alternative voting system. They couldn't, the no to AV people couldn't win that argument because first past the post is shit. <laughs> the other one was better and they didn't want to have that argument so they shifted the frame and they made it all about money. Total fiction. They came up with a figure that it was going to cost two hundred and fifty million pounds to switch to AP to an alternative voting system, and they ran these ads using the classic PR thing of not quite dead babies, that's something not really sick babies. She needs an intensive care system, or whatever, <laughs> rather than an alternative voting thing. And they won the referendum two to one. Now that should have been a warning. They did it again. It's <laughs> <laughs> just big figures. Amazing framing of the debate, um, and it was the same people who did it. Um, 
I'm not going to say anything about right that. Finally, the last thing on messaging, you need a really good messenger, and corporate CEOs are not trusted by anybody. So you need to get somebody else to carry your message into the press, and then to politicians, and so they use what we call third parties. And it could be academics, it could be scientists, it could be doctors, anyone who's trusted to carry that message out. Um, and so here's a couple of examples, and there are so many, many there everywhere. This is one, this is the task force on shale gas. This was a bunch of academics that put out reports encouraging the government to license fracking, and it was entirely funded by the fracking industry. Here's another one, this is a very nice lady, who works for the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is the free market think tank, and we don't know who's funding them, but she goes on news night and she talks about why we need to reform our NHS, but you cannot see the funders behind her. She's a very nice, likeable person. Um, but you can't see them. I don't know whether it's private healthcare company or whatever. Um, and the pioneers of this with the tobacco industry, obviously, for many years, they had their white coats, scientists, doctors, who, would say, who were basically there to deny the link between cancer and smoking. So this is trying to give you a picture of how they manipulate our public debate. Finally, the last thing that they do, so access, messaging, and then this. You want politicians to listen to you as a corporation. You do not want them to listen to your critics. So this is the kind of shadier side of the lobbying industry. And this is, uh, they call them the antis. I'd be an anti. Probably some of you are antis. These are people who are anybody, it could be a residence group, it could be uh, an NGO, it could be a bunch of activists, or whatever, but anybody who opposes the corporation. Is, is often targeted, and they have many, many ways. Uh, they develop many ways of, of, of doing this, and it can be anything as kind of innocuous sounding as monitoring. So there's a lot of online monitoring of activist activity, and they get very twitchy about how they got this 360 degree monitoring thing. So if you bad mail their corporate client in 140 characters or whatever it is now, they'll find it. They'll work out whether you're an influencer. Are you a quote gatherer of people against us? Um, it sounds like the Cold War, I mean, it's, it's quite paranoid and weird, but they will find out. So monitoring, they do that. Um, in the sort of local context, so this is when a developer wants to get planning permission, they do think there's something called consultation. So and consultation in the hands of lobbyists is to flush out the opposition. So there's a quote from a guy who used to work at Tesco's, um, and he said the consultation, the army used to call it reconnaissance, we call it consultation. So that's kind of, yeah, how that works. Um, a classic one that they do is divide and conquer. You do not want a united movement or a group of NGOs or whatever against you, so you want to divide them into the moderates, the more moderate ones that you can deal with and then you can engage in dialogue and you can have rational conversations, and extremists who you want to sideline. So there's been an awful lot of this, and you can see this here. This is from Philip Morris's, uh, it was a 10-year strategy codenamed Project Sunrise. This is this is, we've got these documents because of whistleblowers, it's not made up, they do this. Um, and you can see here that they, the antis, by the way, are public health campaigners, right? Um, and the, yeah, the objective is to minimise the effectiveness of the antis, it's a three year plan, and they, their primary strategy is focusing on basically finding ways to diminish funding for their activities, for their public health campaigners, weaken the credibility of these public health scientists, and driving a wedge between various anti-groups, and that's the divide and conquer bit of it. So this is um, kind of classic stuff. And then finally, it's, it's much rarer, but you do get it when big corporates are involved, um, is the infiltration, or corporate spying. So they will infiltrate activist groups, and you get um, shells, VAE systems, Nestle, they've all done it, um, when they've been placed with uh, a kind of united opposition. But that's a kind of shady side of it. And that, normally that's where I end. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, it's really yeah. depressing. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what the fat bird looks like. This is the this is the industry that has has basically embedded itself in our politics for the last I don't know, however many decades, um, and it is growing. With Brexit, it's growing a lot more. The risks and opportunities that Brexit presents huge risks to business. Some opportunities to some people who like the working plan directive or environmental regulations and opportunities to get rid of those and profit there. Um, but certainly we are seeing kind of increased activity, um, a lot more lobbyists, a lot more Americans coming over, um, a lot more activity. But, um, and this is where I, it's going to be slightly shaky ground because I don't normally do this bit, 
<laughs> but I'm feeling strangely optimistic. It's all fairly recent stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, why I am quite hopeful. I'm giving you three reasons to be cheerful. It's all fairly recent stuff, um, and it's partly because yeah, we've been monitoring sort of Brexit lobbying. It's quite difficult to do because it's quite it's not very transparent at all. But um, there are three things. I don't have a slide for the first thing. Um, but the first thing, it may seem quite minor, but um, uh, from listening to business, and I go and sit in corporate you know, um, conferences and I listen to business, I went to one in the city the other day, and the complaints coming from them, it could have been us talking, it could have been us transparency campaigners. So frustrated were they with government and the lack of access that they had to government. Because government is only talking to its backbench, it's talking to itself at the moment, or has been for a very long time since the vote, since the referendum. And the frustration that they felt, and this is big players, this is Deutsche Bank, this is BlackRock, this is Ernst & Young, and they said, they're going, we can't, we, we've lost our in. Where's our in gone? You know, we were the people at the table, and we're not anymore. Um, and so there was a frustration being felt there. Um, there were also complaints, there was one of the big lobbying law firms um, was making complaints about the secrecy of the government Brexit process, about how they, they didn't have sight of what was going on, so they didn't know any of the processes, so they weren't able to influence it. Now, now I'm not expecting the corporate sector to ride in on its charge and save us, because they you know, they denied their seat at the table, but it's interesting that the current government, the way they're doing it, has pissed off the corporate lobby. Um, it's changed a bit recently, the CBI is now in there, and the city is in there, but certainly, a good long time, I mean it was a year after the referendum that I heard the city talking about this, so I think that's quite interesting. The second thing, I shouldn't quite have to put this, but I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, there's a formula that they've been using, the establishment, I'm going to call it the establishment, that they've been using this formula for whenever there is a crisis in capitalism, or there's a crisis in the, the, the threat of the left wing, basically. Um, there's a formula that they've been using to tackle it for the best part of 100 years. Think back to National Propaganda and the Economic League. 100 years ago, they had, they had a formula, and, and it was, the strategy was, on the one hand, was propaganda for capitalism. Basically, steer the population back into, you know, not thinking that these socialist ideas are any good, and, having faith in the capitalist system for delivering for the ordinary people. So, 100 years ago, the Economic League launched a thing called a Crusade for Capitalism. And they had people going around the country, uh, hustings, handing out leaflets, they called them big men, able to handle themselves in a crowd. And they would basically speak in very simple terms to people, and they would explain economics in very simple terms to the masses, right? So that was their kind of propaganda for capitalism. And then, the second problem was to basically tackle what they called subversion ruthlessly and relentlessly. This is all documented. And this was, this was about undermining the opposition, tackling the entities, whether it be the socialists or the anarchists or whoever it was that was organising against them. And they ran blacklists of people, they had huge databases of people. They had agent provocateurs, they went to disrupted left wing meetings, all this kind of stuff. This is 100 years ago. But this formula, this two pronged attack, has been followed over the decades. Whenever there has been a crisis, so in the 40s, there was, it was exactly the same thing. It was a different body called Ains of Industry. They ran, so this is, this is probably slightly later in the 70s, again, when progressive movements were taking off and people were falling out of love with the kind of capitalist system. They would run these adverts. The moment of truth, don't, don't vote Labour, blah, blah, whatever. You know, people bound up, the end of freedom. So these, every time there's a crisis, they've done this, and they've, 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 they've propaganda for capitalism and attacking the opposition. And you can see it happening now. But I don't think it's working. And I, I, I don't know quite, it's more of a gut feeling, actually. Um, but, so if we just take this side of the slide, you can see here, this is uh, Liam Fox, and he's at the launch of something called the Institute for Free Trade. Now this is a sort of direct descendant from, from national propaganda. It is a, it, 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 it's raison d'etre is to promote free market capitalism. Um, 
And the reason they're doing it is because if we do fall off a cliff and go for hard Brexit, I mean, we're talking about capitalism of the low end too, you know, proper deregulated, um, you know, let the market decide anything kind of, anything goes, capitalism. So that basically they need to do quite a lot of propaganda to get people on board. Um, this is actually, I thought this was the same one, but it's a different chandelier. It's a different launch of a different <laughs> lobby group for capitalism. This one's called Onward! Um, launched at around the same time, but again, has the purpose of propaganda for um, free market ideas. It's all about making things popular. This is from Francis Wall. I'll let you read it. And then these are our big men who are explaining economics in simple terms to the masses. This is David Mark, obviously. I loved his tweet the other day. On the Brexit division, it is obvious. If you spend less on one thing, it's available for that. Yeah, okay. It's a brilliant piece of economic nonsense. Um, but this is this, it is them standing out 100 years ago explaining it's a massive why it's good for us. Um, so it, it's following the formula. And then on this side, obviously, we've seen a lot of anti Corbyn, McDonald kind of fear, scaremongering about what it would mean for the economy if they ever came to power. Um, and then I'm just going to mention this quickly. This was a story we, we read um, the other day when I had saved out my bike, like they nicked it. But um, in the mirror, this is, um, we noticed the arrival of a very interesting firm. Um, it was a Republican firm, an American lobbying firm, and it specializes in something called opposition research. And basically, that is digging up dirt on your opponents. That's what it does. And they had spent their, their alliance with the Republican Party, and prior to the 2016 US election, they spent four years digging up dirt on Hillary Clinton. And then they would put it out in the press and social media, whatever. That's what they did. And it would have had an impact, because it wasn't about increasing Trump, it was about reducing Hillary's vote. So that's what they did. And then they arrived in the UK um, at the end of last year. Yeah, end of last year. Um, and it's full of people from uh, Conservative Party headquarters, but it's a private company. Um, we don't know who's funding it. They said that the Tories are funding it in the world, but that, I'm not sure. We don't know. But this is basically, this is, this is your equivalent of you know, tackling subversion ruthlessly and relentlessly. This is the kind of 21st century version of it. So I think this is the formula, but I don't, to me it doesn't have the same traction. It doesn't cut. It seems panicky, it seems desperate, and it seems I don't know how effective it's going to be, if that's what it is. So that's the second point, the reason to be cheerful. But the third point I think is more significant, and this is what I'm excited about. And, okay, I'm going to talk about the money. This is, okay, the thing that makes me hopeful about Jeremy Corbyn is he hasn't got a friend in the world in the lobbying industry. Oh, they didn't bother. <laughs> Why talk to Jeremy Corbyn? Because you always talk to opposition politicians because one day they might get into power. Not him. <laughs> so literally, when he, when, he, when he became leader, the whole of the lobbying industry was aghast. They were like, oh my God, does anybody know him? <laughs> that, right? That's a plus, right? That is a plus. Right? I mean, of course, he does make some copies and he knows a lot of trade in there. But, that's a plus point. But I think what's significant about this picture is not him. I think it's a picture of a crowd. This is a picture of people who want to engage in politics in a way that is meaningful. And, and it's not just coming out to listen to him speak. It is gathering in places and to talk about ideas. It's bottom-up policy making. It's not, it's not that, which is these people are coming up with ideas with the Tory party and, you know, it's elite corporate funded propaganda down, and I think this is exciting. Um, there was the World Transformed event in Brighton last year that I gave a talk at, and it was so exciting. There were so many people there talking, I mean really informed people as well, talking about policy in a way that I thought, oh my god, you know, I know so much, I'm so excited about it, it was really cool. But it's not just the Labour Party, the Tory Party, they had something cool, I and mean, it was mocked from being Tory Glastonbury. <laughs> you know, they had some marquees. They put marquees up in a field and they invited people along to come and discuss policy. Great! That's fantastic. Because it's not this top down, this is what we're going to do, this is what you're going to think about it. It's bottom up, and I think that's very exciting. And then I'll, find it, I'll end on this. We're here, we're talking about this whole series, is talking about policy ideas, it's talking about um, 
what we want to be excited about in the next ten, ten years, what we want the world to look like. And it's and it, it heartens me every time that anybody actually turns up with these things. <laughs> this is great. So I think, you know, carry on doing these things, carry on talking about policy, and I will end it there.